Yes. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be in God's house today, man. Amen. If you have a Bible, I'd like to, to open them to Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 of Ephesians chapter 2. And next week, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 10, so you can kind of bookmark uh, your Bible there. We're going to be back there next week. Uh, it's a, uh, I figured I could preach uh, one message that lasted two hours or, or two messages that lasted uh, 15 minutes apiece. No, something like that. Yes. Amen. Amen. So uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, for the next couple weeks is something very amazing. In, in fact, um, there's a lot of things in our life that are amazing. And, and we use that word all the time. I use it as a descriptive word all the time. Something amazing. Um, I thought this morning, uh, as I went outside and, and sat on the deck and was drinking coffee and just praying, uh, wasn't it an amazing morning this morning weather-wise? I mean, finally, a little bit of relief, and it was amazing to be able to sit outside and just enjoy uh, the morning. I was thinking about other things that are so amazing, and, and Mike, I happen to think of you. Um, I know you're distracted by all the little babies over there. Uh, isn't it amazing that you have your family with you today? Isn't that awesome, you know, to have, have your, your kids and, and, and your grandkids? And that's, Sandy, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? You're, you're holding something amazing right now, aren't you? Yes. That's an amazing thing. Uh, isn't it amazing, Cody and Carrie? Uh, it, just in a few short weeks, you're going to be husband and wife? Isn't that amazing? Carrie, you need to act like it's amazing, okay? <laughs> yes. She'll say, it'll be amazing after all the planning's done, everything comes together, and we say, I do, and then we can just have a great time, right? Yes. That's amazing. It's amazing to me that you're allowing this guy to go on a mission trip just a week before you're going to get married. But uh, he's kind of, he, he's just a, a byproduct of everything, right? You, you've got everything planned, right? He just needs to show up that day, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, isn't it amazing? And some of you can relate to this. And some of you more than others. Isn't it amazing that you're here today? Isn't it amazing for a lot of reasons? Dewey raised his hand and said amen to that. Yes, yes. Isn't it amazing that God has spared your life and you are here today? Isn't it amazing that just within the last few years, you probably, maybe months, years, that you could say, I never thought I'd be sitting in First Baptist Church listening to that preacher. Isn't it amazing how God works in our life and sometimes we don't even realize what God is doing? Amen? It's amazing to me. Now, the truth is, and this is where we're headed, there should never be and there can be nothing quite as amazing as God's amazing grace. Did you hear what I had to say? There's never anything in your life that is going to be more amazing than God's amazing grace. Amen. If, if you don't realize that, if you don't see that, if you don't acknowledge that, His amazing grace is still there. Now, I would want to say this. I believe in churches all across this country, maybe all across this world, that we forgot the amazing God that we serve. In fact, if we really understood the amazingness of God, I think our worship would even be more lively. I think our praise to God would be from the blowing the rooftop off the, ce off the ceiling. I, I think that whenever the preacher preached, you couldn't get enough of God's word. I, I would think that no matter what happened, you would say, but isn't God amazing? You know what we need to do as believers? How many of you are believers in Christ and saved by the blood of Jesus? Say amen. Amen. If so, then we need to put amazing back into God's grace. Did you hear me? Sometimes we get so busy with life and things going on and caught up in this world and focused on things that we shouldn't be that we forget that God's amazing grace is the greatest thing this world has ever known. Now, I tell you this. I need to put amazing back into God's grace because I can never do justice to God's grace. I believe that we can all. Why, why do we need to do that? Why, why do we need to put amazing back into God's grace? Well, for some of you here today, and I don't know who you are, but God does, you're hanging on by a thread. 
you don't know how you're going to make it. You don't know uh, what's going to happen. You, you have things going on in your life, and you're hanging on, and you need to hang on to God's grace. For some of you today, you need to let go and, and, and truly just worship God in the amazing way that he has given you to worship him freely. You know, everybody needs God's amazing grace, amen? amen. And, and I believe that in this passage of Scripture, I believe that Paul brings to life what everybody needs. I, I believe that Paul, when he wrote this letter to the church of Ephesus or a circulatory letter around the, the Asia, however you want to look at that, I believe that it was something that Paul knew that everyone that lived during that time needed that was going to live for Jesus. You know, it's amazing to me, and I, I don't know how many people say, well, that Bible, you know, the Bible's just an old storybook, and, and I don't know if it's true or not, and I don't know if I can believe it or not, but the reality is we need the Bible. We need to hang on to God's Word, and God's Word speaks to us today as loudly as it did when it was written. Amen. So... What do we want to do? We want to put amazing back into God's grace. And we can't do that acting like, you know, when we come in here, it should be like a celebration and not like a funeral. When we come in here, it ought to be celebrating what God's done in our life this past week, this past year, for eternity. You know, I believe that's what Paul wanted his believers to, to realize when he wrote this letter. And he sent this letter to them. He loved them. He longed for them. He prayed for them. He wanted them to remember God's amazing grace is what will get us through. So today as we read this, I want you to think about the words that Paul penned that God inspired him to write. I want you to think about God's amazing grace as we begin to break this down and, and, and look at what God's amazing grace can really do. Let's all stand and we're going to read Ephesians chapter 2 starting in verse 1 and going through verse 5. Now, folks, if verse 1 doesn't get your blood flowing, you better check your pulse. If verse 1 doesn't speak to you and doesn't get you going, then you better make sure that you're still alive. Verse 1 says this, and you, take your finger, I want you to take your finger, and I want you to point it back at yourself. He's talking to you. God wants to speak to you today. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. I pray, God, for the one here today that needs to experience your amazing grace of salvation in Christ. Father, I pray for the one here today who is a believer in Christ, but is not living under the amazing grace that you've given to them. Father, I pray today for those who are struggling, those who are, are tired and weary, those who are looking for something to hold on to, those who are celebrating the fact that they are experiencing the amazing grace that you've given to them. Father, speak to us all today. Help us, God, just to glean from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm going to look at just three things today about God's amazing grace. The first thing I want us to see is God's amazing grace can make dead people alive. God's amazing grace can make dead people alive. Now what do I want to say to that? Isn't that amazing? Folks, isn't that amazing? God can make dead people alive. Now, here's the problem, and I think we all have this problem. Your level of amazement to this verse, verse 1, is, has everything to do with your idea about salvation. You see, God doesn't simply revive people. God doesn't simply renew them. God doesn't rescue them. God 
resurrects them. You see, God resurrects people from the dead. It's like this. How many of you are aware of the, the story unfolding in Thailand about the ones who are the, the young teenagers that are trapped in the cave? Anybody hear about that? If you heard of that, raise your hand. Okay, most people have. Now, I don't know a lot about it other than my wife. She's my news feed of a morning. I get up and she comes out and she starts telling me all the news and I'm like, I don't need a newscaster. I got my wife. She tells me what's going on. But she was reading this morning where two of those teens, actually now four, see my newscaster just told me an update. Four of those teens have been rescued now. Can you imagine the fear? Can you imagine the hopelessness? Can you imagine what they felt when they were trapped in that cave and did not think they would ever see the light of day? Can you put yourself in that position and think about what would I have felt if I had been in that cave thinking that I am here and I am as good as dead? And then think about how, how much joy and amazement they must have felt whenever finally those scuba rescue guys came to, uh, to rescue them. H how much relief and how amazed they were that someone found them that someone was going to try to rescue them and save them. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that those guys would, would, would risk their lives to go in to try to save these teens? Now I've learned that one of them has already died trying to rescue them. And they deserve all of the glory and all of the credit that they can get for going in and trying to rescue these boys. But isn't it amazing that we can look at that story and think about that story and think about how, how awesome it is and praise those who are rescuing them and the hopelessness that was with those boys and now they have been found and they're going to be rescued. <coughs> rescued. Those boys were alive, but they were rescued and given more life. Now how about this? What if I took you to a cemetery... And someone came to the cemetery and they proclaimed that someone would rise from the dead and they would rise to new life out of the cemetery. How many of you would be amazed by that? How many of you would say, that is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Those, that person was dead and now he's alive. You see, when it comes to Christ, that is exactly what Jesus did. Whenever Jesus died on the cross, whenever Jesus gave his life for ours, we know this, and I'm preaching to the choir to a certain extent, but the bottom line is this, we have forgotten how amazing it is that God has taken someone who is dead <clears throat> and made them alive. Now you think about that. How amazing is God's grace that we were once dead in our trespasses and sin. We were against God, we were disobedient to God, we weren't just a bad person that God made good. We weren't just messed up and God cleaned us up. We weren't just going against God. We were totally out of God's, uh, out of God's will. But God reached down and saved you. H how much should that be amazing to us that God can make dead people alive? Well, I think someday when you see Jesus face to face, you'll realize how dead people are alive. God's amazing grace can make dead people alive. In fact, in Second or excuse me, Colossians chapter two, and I want to read this to you because I think it really makes sense. Colossians chapter two and verse eleven. If you have your Bibles, look at that for a minute. It says, "In Him, in Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands." By putting off the body of the sin of flesh by circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. In other words, God has raised you from the dead because he raised Christ from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him having forgiven all your trespasses. How many of you feel like you need to be forgiven by God? Uh, how many of you feel like there's things in your life, maybe you're lost and you need to be forgiven and saved by Jesus and rescued and resuscitated and resurrected? 
But how many of us as believers need to remember that God died for our sins, and even though I am in my trespasses and sin, Jesus took them to the cross and paid the price. He wiped out, look at verse 14, he wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. In other words, the law was against us, Jesus was for us. Which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The trespasses and sin that we were dead in, Jesus took those and nailed them to the cross in such a way and bled and died for them that we could be forgiven, that our uncircumcised hearts could become circumcision of God. And we are now the redeemed, living, saved of Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved. You weren't just sick, folks. You were lost and dead. You weren't just messed up. You were dead. God's amazing grace can make dead people alive. If that's not enough, then I don't know whatever would be. God's amazing grace can also set you on a new course. I believe we can see clearly that God wants to give us a new path. God wants to set us on a new course. And the Bible's very clear that there's only one of two courses that you can be on. You can be the best person you want to be, and you're still not on the right course if you're not saved by God. You can be the right person trying to do the right thing and be in church and be, know the Bible and, and, and know truth and all that, but if you haven't accepted God's amazing grace of salvation, then you're still on the wrong path. You see, Jesus says very clearly in Matthew, he talks about in Matthew the fact that, that there's two ways and two paths that people go down. Matthew chapter 7, if you want to turn there, go ahead. In fact, somebody had a conversation. We had a conversation about this, I think, maybe just the other day. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Look what it says here. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it, in, in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. There are many people headed on the wrong course, on the wrong path, headed to destruction. We watch them every day. We work with them. We live with them. We, we go play ball with them, whatever it may be, but they're dead. They're on the wrong path and headed on the wrong course. Do you notice here that Jesus says that narrows the gate that leads unto salvation? Why is it so narrow? Well, as a believer in Christ, how many of you believe that Jesus is the, the only way, the only truth, and the only life? Amen? Amen. If, you, if you say that out in public, if you say that in our society today, you are narrow-minded and you don't understand because there's many ways to get to God's what they'll tell you. But the reality is this, there is one way. That's what the Bible says. And that way is Jesus Christ narrows the gate. Few will find it. Why? Because a lot of dead people think they're alive when truly they are dead in their trespasses and sins. They have not accepted God's amazing grace and they're on the broad path to destruction. You see, back in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, in which you once walked according to the course. And I want to say something to that. In which you once walked what we need is not believers acting like they've never walked the wrong path. We need believers who say, I have walked the wrong path and I'm trying to get it right. The worst thing we can do as believers is to act like and forget our past and not remember that we were once walking in darkness. Whenever we try to portray ourselves as someone who is better than someone else, we are no better than anyone else. We are the same as everyone else, but we, are, we are, went from death to life through Jesus Christ. Amen. I think the reason why churches today, and I hate when people say that I don't want to go to church because churches are full of hypocrites. You know, the truth be known, that's a big lie and an excuse in many cases. But sometimes there is some truth to that. Sometimes we forget how many of you, now, how many of you are 40 years or older? Raise your hand. There's a bunch of you in here. Me included. How many of you now look back at some things that some young folks do, and you think, how in the world could they do that? What are they thinking? I can't believe they do that. Well, I can't believe they listen to that kind of music. I can't believe they watch that kind of thing. I can't believe they go those places. I can't believe they do those things, and you judge them. <laughs> 
and then you've forgotten that you once walked in darkness. If I could go back to when you were a teenager or early 20s, and I could put it up on the screen for everybody to see, you'd probably crawl under the seat right now. That's right. Some of us are quicker learners than others, Merle. But I thank God that you're saved by God's grace. I thank God that whether you're 10 years old or 80 years old, God's grace is still sufficient. I thank God, but I think a lot of times we do forget that we once walked in darkness, just like Paul said, I once was blind, I once could not see, I once was lost, but amazing grace, now I'm found. You see, I think we need to remember that we once walked in darkness. According to the course of this world, there's only two courses that people are on. The course of this world, the course of destruction, the course of lostness, the course of dead, and the course of life that God offers through his amazing grace. You were once, once walked according to the course of this world. Don't forget that. To the prince of power of the air, Satan, the spirit of, uh, who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You know, I thank God for verse 4. In verse 4, and there's times in the Bible that you see these two words and it has a changing effect from, from God's judgment to God's salvation. In, in verse 4 it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, but God. Now, you could say but someone else, but, but Don, but, but Cody, but, but Lee, but Merle, and it really has no effect. But God, who is rich in mercy and his love for us, in Romans 5.8, it says this. Does anybody know what Romans 5.8 says? It says, but God. But God demonstrated his love to us. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. You see, we were helpless, hopeless. We were dead. And I love the, I asked Cody if we could sing that song, Glorious Day. Because when he called my name, I was walking the wrong course. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. But God, who is rich in mercy and his love for us, praise God and his amazing grace, called me out of that grave. Now, I've got something that I want to say to that. And I'm not, I really, and I know they would never say anything, and I know they wouldn't want any glory, but we see examples of that every day. But God, who is rich in mercy, and his great love for us, by, by grace we've been saved. <clears throat> Jerry Helms, you blessed me last week. His mom passed away, and Donna May, and Carolyn. And Jerry came to me and he said, I don't know how I would have handled this if God hadn't saved me. I just look at things differently now. I, I know where my mom is. She's in heaven. And I see Jerry and... There's things that you say, and you may not think that you know a lot. You may not be a Bible scholar. But when you come to me and you say those type things, and you've said many of those things along the way, don't think you haven't. Jerry's just a what you see is what you get kind of guy. Amen. But when, is, don't we need more of that in our Christian walk? Amen. And he'll say, I don't see how anybody couldn't want to be in church if they're saved. I, I don't see how anybody wouldn't want to just praise God and serve God for what he's done. Maybe we forgot, but God demonstrated his love to us. Jerry, you were a demonstration of God's amazing grace this past week. Kevin Fox, where are you, Kevin? I, oh, right behind Jerry. Kevin, it amazes me what God's done in your life. And I know everyone. I'm not, saying, I'm, I'm not trying to single out. I'm making examples here. Kevin, God has done a work in your life like nothing other. God has taken and delivered you. He has set you on the path. You know exactly why God has you and saved you, and, and you are serving the Lord. You're writing testimony of what God's done in your life. You're sharing what you believe. You're standing for what God wants. And that is exactly what we can see that God has set these men on a new course. So the question I have for you, and then we need to move on, is this. If God has saved you by his amazing grace, and God has set you on a new course, why in the world are you messing around on the other course? Amen. 
why in the world once you see God's grace and have experienced his goodness and his glory and his love and his mercy, why would you want to do that? We need to be focused on God's amazing grace. See, I believe that we know we were once in darkness. We once were lost. But God powerfully and amazingly saved us. Next thing I want us to hear here, God's amazing grace. It can make dead people alive, folks. It, it can set you on a new course. But it can also change your eternal destination. You know, I know that a lot of times preachers get to where they preach on topics and subjects and things in the Bible, and sometimes we don't preach enough about heaven, and we don't preach enough about hell. In fact, Mike, we had this conversation and I know that a lot of people say, well, we just don't have the hell fire brimstone preachers like we used to. And the truth is, the reality of hell is still there. The reality of heaven is still there. How many of us want to focus on heaven where we want to be someday? Amen? Amen. But how many of us focus on those we know that don't know Christ that are going to hell? You see, we love to talk and think and preach about God's amazing grace, His great amazing love, His amazing mercy, and we should. Did you know Jesus talked multitude of times more about hell than He did about heaven? You know what I see in this? We must never ignore the reality of the other side of God's grace. Do you know there's an other side of God's grace? And I want you to know this, the characteristics of God are to the fullest degree. When, I, when we say God is love, He is love beyond any measure we'll ever know. When I, we say that He has mercy, He has mercy beyond anything we can ever experience. When I say He has grace, His grace is more than we can ever imagine. But by the same token, in verse 3, when it talks about the wrath of God, the wrath of God is the reality of God, the characteristic of God that no one wants to think about. We would not serve a just, holy, true God if His wrath was not real. If there was no consequence for sin, we would not need a Savior. If there was no reason for God's grace, then we wouldn't understand God's wrath. It speaks of God's wrath that is stored for the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? Mark my word, it is those who are not saved by God's grace. What do we know about God's wrath? Well, sometimes we think God is punishing us. God is showing us. God is, is punishing a nation or a, a, a community or a person or something like that. We have no idea of how strong God's wrath really is. Do you know what God's wrath... Do you know why God's wrath is not being poured out on people right now? It's because of God's great love. Do, do you know why people are not facing the wrath of God at this very moment? Now you may have consequences and you may suffer. And even Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction there. That is but a small, small measure of what God's wrath really is going to look like. God's wrath is limited. Why? It is being restrained because of his great love for us. Because of his grace, because of his mercy, when? Until the day of judgment. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3 with me. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 7. It says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 7. I hear Bibles turning. There's nothing more sweet to a preacher than hearing a bunch of Bibles turning. Let's read verse 7 together again. Look at it with me again. But the heavens and earth, which are now preserved, God is preserved, preserving them by his word, but they are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In other words, God's wrath... God's judgment, God's destruction is being reserved for the day of judgment. When is the day of judgment? It was when all men will stand before, excuse me, all lost men will stand before the great white throne of God. It says in verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this, one thing that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not 
slacking concerning his promises. Some people would think, well, God has not, Jesus hasn't come back. Things haven't happened. I can go about my way. I can do what I want to do. God is going to put off his punishment forever. But it says the Lord is not slack. Concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but his long-suffering. How many of you have ever experienced a time when you had to be long-suffering? Let me put it this way. How many of you feel like your patience is tested sometime? Amen. And I'm not talking about the person sitting beside you necessarily. There's a difference between having patience and having long suffering. Long suffering, in fact, I told Doug Payne that one time. He was trying to kid with me. And he said, you know what? He prayed for God for patience and God, I entered into his life. And so he had to have patience. And I said, yeah, Doug, but I was praying for long-suffering, and then you come along too. <laughs> you see, long-suffering is this. It is not just having patience. It is the love of God that has the restraining power of the wrath of God. So in other words, why doesn't God, if you were God for a day, what would you do? You would probably come down and you'd just say, you know what? I'm tired of these people ignoring me. I'm tired of these people not paying attention to me. I'm tired of these people not accepting my son and end it all. But God is long-suffering. It says that he is long-suffering, look at this, towards us. Why would God be so patient with you? Why would God be so long-suffering towards you? It's because he doesn't want anyone to perish. And that all would come to repentance and faith believing. You see, God's eternal wrath will be poured upon those who are eternally destined for destruction. I don't say that to be doom and gloom. I say that because of this. How many of you feel like you've experienced God's amazing grace in your life? Say amen. amen. Then I want to ask you these few questions. Isn't it amazing that in spite of all this, all God's amazing grace, what he's done in your life, we choose to live a half-hearted life for God. That we choose to live half-heartedly for God. You're not sold out. You're not committed all the way. You want to have one foot in heaven and one foot in the world. You want to live your way part of the time and live God's way the rest of the time. And you're half in and half out. I believe in the, in the book of uh, Revelation it talks about the church of Laodicea. It says you're not hot, you're not cold, and it makes Jesus sick and he just wants to puke you out. That's kind of what he says. Why do we live half-heartedly for God in spite of his amazing grace? How about this? It is, it's amazing, in spite of all this, we have, to take it, we have a take it or leave it mentality. In other words, when it comes to church, I'll go to church if I want to, I won't if I don't. If I've got something better to do, I'll do it. If I want to come, I will. We're not committed. Or when it comes to prayer. You know, I want to pray every day, but I don't pray every day. Why? Because I'm not committed to prayer every day. I know I need to read my Bible. I know it's God's Word. I know it's alive. I know it's moving. I know it's living. But I just don't seem to have time to read it. I can take it or leave it. It's amazing to me, in spite of all this, that we don't give and serve and love like we should. You know what we do with giving and serving and loving? We have a way in our minds of making excuses. Somehow, some way, we make excuses, and I do the same thing, so I'm pointing right back at me with this. I don't give like I should because God would understand that I can't give. I, I don't serve like I could because God understands I just don't have the time. I don't love like I should because, you know what, God knows what that person did to me, and I can't love them. And we justify it in our minds. You know what we do? We forget about God's amazing grace. He put no limits on his love, his giving, and his serving. And finally, isn't it amazing, in spite of all this, we don't tell anyone about God's amazing grace? I want to ask you this. Why do you think God has you here on this earth? Well, number one, to praise him and glorify him. And if you're not doing that with all your heart today, then why not? Don't you realize that you were once dead? I mean dead. You weren't just sick. You weren't just messed up. You weren't just kind of wrong. You were dead. But God, in spite of all that, saved you. 
maybe it's this. Maybe it's the fact that no matter what the preacher says, until you open your heart up completely to the Lord, you will never, never understand God's amazing grace. It's right here today. Do you believe that God is here with us today? If you believe God is here with us, His amazing grace is flowing right now. And the only way that you can experience that is to open your heart up to Him. It's to admit that things in your life that's not right. It's to say, you know what, God, you're sold out to me and I'm not sold out to you. God, I want this church to grow. I want this church to love. I want this church to serve. But let somebody else. No, let me, God. Use me. You know, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper here in a minute. I pray if nothing else, you'll just think about God's amazing grace and what he's done in your life. Or what he wants to do. If you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would come to this altar and we'll get down on our knees and you can accept Christ and give your life to him today. You can experience his amazing grace. It is free, it is ready, and it is available. But believers, I pray that we're challenged today. The amazing grace that God has, you know what, we take that for granted. I do so many times. God demonstrated his love that while I was a sinner, while I was dead, while I was on the wrong path, while I was doomed for hell, his son Jesus died for me. Folks, that's amazing grace. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this time that we have to truly make a, a commitment, surrender, a life change to you, God. Father, I would pray that we would remember the blood that was given, the body that was broken for you, for us, through you. Father, I thank you for your amazing grace. And Lord, I will be the first to admit I was once dead. And you made me alive. And Lord, let me never get over that. May we praise you with everything that we have, serve you, love you, give. In Jesus' name. Amen.